Hi, I'm Jean from the Hachette Book Group here today with Governor Chris Christie, whose book, Let Me Finish, Trump, the Kushners, Bannon, New Jersey, and the Power of In Your Face Politics is out this week. Thank you for joining us this morning. Happy to be here. This is a premier live signing, which means that people watching us can get an autographed copy live on premiercollectibles.com slash Chris Christie. You may also submit a question which the governor may be able to answer live during this signing. While we begin with the many, many signatures that will take place, I thought I'd start off with a few questions of my own. Sure, that'd okay, be great. Good, okay. So, Trump is obviously a key player in this book and someone you've been friends with for over 15 years. Were you worried about his reaction to the book coming out? How did you think he would respond? I wasn't worried about it. I, I, I spoke to the president um, right after I signed the deal with Hachette um, and before it was announced publicly to let him know that I was writing a book and telling him that, in general, what it was going to be about and what it was going to be like. And I told him I'd keep him up to date. And from time to time when we would talk, um, I would update him on how mm -hmm. the progress mm -hmm. of the book was going, when it was going to be out. Um, and then finally, you know, when the book came out, or as the book was coming out, um, last Saturday, um, I had a copy delivered okay. to the White House. I was wondering about that. <laughs> so he'd have a chance to take a look before um, everybody else got to take a look at the book. And the great thing is that the last few days I've been so busy with all the book-related events, I haven't had an opportunity to talk to him. But he got interviewed um, by the New York Times yesterday in the Oval Office. And if any of you go to the Times website today, there's a transcript of the interview that he did with the publisher, Mr. Salzberger. And the very last question he was asked was about my book. And he said, oh, I thought it was, I haven't gotten to read it. He said, but I've gotten excerpts of it. And he said, I thought it was great. He was really respectful to me oh, good. and nice to me, and I thought it was great. So I was never worried about it because we've been friends for 17 years. And I, and, and the interesting thing is, while there's other books out there where people are, you know, saying things and, and there's a lot of dispute about whether what they're saying is true, you know, we've been out for a week now, and there hasn't been one person who's been written about in this book who has put out a public statement saying anything that we said in here was untrue. And that's gratifying to me, and I think... That's what the president cares about more than anything else. That's true. That's very good. Okay, well, I've got another one for you. So you were one of the first people in the 2016 race to publicly endorse Trump in the primary, which actually surprised a lot of people. How easy was that a decision for you to make? In retrospect, do you have any regrets about that decision? It wasn't an easy decision to make because when you've run yourself, um, part of it is hard about just letting go um, and deciding that, you know, you're going to help somebody else get the job that you were trying so hard to get yourself. But a couple of things. One, I knew that um, I knew we had been friends with Donald at that time for 14 years. And so both my wife and I were very comfortable um, with our relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And he was of, you know, well, we had good relationships with almost all of the candidates in the race. He was the one who was our most longstanding friend in the race. Um, and so that made it a little bit easier. And also, I had made the decision by the time I endorsed that he was going to win the nomination. He had come in second place in Iowa. He had won New Hampshire two to one. He had won South Carolina by double digits. And any other year, they would have said that person's going to be the nominee. Because it was Trump, the media was holding back on that. And I just said, he's going to be the nominee, and I want to go in and use the, the years of friendship we have to try to make him a better candidate. And if he ultimately beats Hillary Clinton, make him a better president. So that was the thought process behind it, and I no, I don't have any regrets. I, I, elections are a binary choice. As I say to folks all the time, he was not my first choice to be president. I was. Um, <laughs> but I, if it couldn't be me, I would much rather have him than have had Hillary Clinton. And so um, working for him um, is something that I'm happy I did because I think the country has better policies because of it. I do think it's interesting when you say the letting go part because that's a very – Profound statement and a very honest statement. I like that. Okay. One of the things you write about in the book is how your overarching transition plan for the Trump administration was basically trashed when you left as transition chair. Had your plan actually been put into action, what do you think the biggest difference would have been for Trump in the early days of his administration? He would have had more and better people. Um, we had vetted three candidates for every cabinet position and every senior staff position in the White House. As even as it sits today, there's still over 160 Senate-confirmed positions that he hasn't even nominated someone for. Um, so, and when we say it's my plan, it, I was the I was the chairman of the transition and led it, but we had 140 people 
uh, on the transition team who worked from uh, June to Election Day to put this plan together. And so it wasn't just my plan. It was the plan of all these incredible experts that we assembled um, to try to help uh, Donald Trump, if he became president-elect, get off to the best start. And unfortunately, as I, as I detail in the book, um, folks like um, Steve Bannon, like Rick Dearborn, like Jared Kushner, um, decided that they wanted to be in control of the whole thing. And so they fired me. But worse than firing me was that they, they threw all that work out. Yeah. Literally all that work got thrown in the dumpster. So uh, and they started from scratch with 71 days to go before the uh, presidential uh, inauguration. There's no way you could do all that kind of work in 71 yeah. days. In fact, one of the funny stories from the, from the book is that um, Donald did not like the idea of having a transition um, organization starting in the summer, even though there's a law now that requires it. He said it was bad karma to be preparing for a job that you hadn't won yet. Um, and he didn't want me to do it. Um, and I told him, like, it's required by the law. You have to do it, you know. <laughs> one of the funny things he said to me, which I reported in the book, was, he goes, come on, Chris. You and I are so smart that together we could get the whole transition done if we just left the victory party right. two hours early. Um, and I just looked at him and I said, oh, if that were only so, <laughs> Donald. But, you know, don't worry about it. I'll handle it for you. You go get elected. I'll have everything ready right. if you do. So it's a shame that it happened the way it did. And he's paying the price and the country's still paying the price for the acts of some inexperienced, selfish folks who put their own interests ahead of the interest of the candidate and the country. Oh. Okay. All right, this book has a lot of insider information about the administration and your relationship with so many key people in it. Is there anything you consider considered not putting in the book? Anything you thought might be too private or controversial? Well, actually, there was more stuff that I was concerned about putting in the book from my own personal side um, than I was about the political stuff on Trump. You know, I talk really openly um, in there about the early years of my marriage and, and the fact that my wife and I separated twice um, during those early years when we were, you know, 23 and 22 when we got married. And I think, I remember when I showed her the draft of that chapter, she was like, we're really talking about this? <laughs> and I said, well, I really think it's a part of the overall story that nothing that's worth anything in life is easy. That True. life doesn't always go in a straight line up. And that I think if people hear that from folks that they know through the public realm and who they just assume are successful at everything they do, um, I think that's encouraging to people to know that whether it's a tough time in your marriage, whether it's a tough time at your job, um, whether it's health, you know, um, considerations, which I talk really candidly in there about that and, you know, my efforts to lose weight and all the rest of that. It, you know, I think all those things belong in the book because they encourage people um, to know that if I have those problems and I'm working to try to overcome them and have overcome some of them, that, you know, they should be able to do it too. It also humanizes, which I think is a very important I point. hope so. And I think, yeah. you know, and certainly, there were some things that I didn't put in the book um, on the political side because I thought either I was restricted to by the law, oh. so there's things that I learned as U.S. attorney um, that I just couldn't talk about because I'm legally prohibited from doing it. And there was some stuff that I learned in the campaign which I just thought was inappropriate for me to share because it was too personal about someone else. Mm -hmm. And so it's their story to tell. Right. If they want to tell it someday, not mine to, to tell on them. Well, okay. So what we're going to actually go to questions from the audience. But what I did want to say to everybody, this is a reminder. We are our, we want to remind you to go to premiercollectibles.com slash Chris Christie and get a signed copy of the book. So I'm actually going to start with Barbara from the Bronx who asked, do you think President Trump will be reelected? I think right now he's the favorite to be reelected. Um, I think, you know, America has a pretty long track record of reelecting presidents. We have very few in our history of our 44 presidents, even though Donald Trump is the 45th. That's a trick question in history <laughs> because um, uh, Grover Cleveland was both the 22nd and 24th president of the United States. So even though we're at number 45, we've only had 44 men 
who have held the job, even though he is the 45th president. What you learned. Because Grover Cleveland got himself <laughs> two numbers. Another New Jersey guy um, who was president and he grabbed himself two numbers, which is pretty typical of all of us. But I think we have a history of reelecting presidents. We don't know who the Democratic nominee is going to be. So I think right now the president is the favorite to be reelected. But there's a long way to go two years. between now and November of 2020. So, uh, you know, remember, to give you some perspective, four years ago, right now, the front runner for the Republicans was Jeb Bush. Mm -hmm. And Jeb wound up getting not one delegate. So, you know, what I like to say about presidential races are that they are the brightest lights in the world. And when you get under those bright lights, there are only two options. Either you shine or you melt. And so we're going to see in the Democratic race who's going to shine and who's going to melt. And then I'll be able to tell a lot more about whether the president is the favorite or the underdog to be reelected. But right now, I'd say he's the favorite. It's a long list coming. Okay. Yes. So we're going to start with Gary from Madison, Indiana. Have you considered running for president in 2024? 2024 is a long way away. <laughs> um, that's six sure years is. or five years from now. Um, what I've said when I've been asked this during the book tour is that I would never preclude doing it again. I mean, I think once you run for president and you cross that line to think, hey, I could do this job and I'd want to do this job, I think it's really hard to then just abandon that in your own mind. Mm -hmm. But I also would not want to do it unless I really saw a pathway to winning. It's so hard to do. But the idea of doing it just for the fun of it uh, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't attract me all that much. So if I saw in the future that I thought I had a real legitimate chance to win, um, I would definitely consider it again. Um, of course, I answered that question without first consulting with Mary Pat, <laughs> who I think would be um, significantly less enthusiastic about it um, than I am. So there would be <laughs> some period of negotiation on that one as well, I, I suspect. All right. Okay, well, I'm going to go to John from Huntsville, Missouri. What is your favorite accomplishment as the governor of New Jersey? My favorite accomplishment as governor of New Jersey is the rebuilding of my state after Hurricane Sandy. Oh, um, it was the second worst natural disaster in American history behind Katrina. Um, we lost 365,000 homes in 24 hours. And um, at the time, two-thirds of or, or the residents of our state were without power. Um, you wake up to that kind of disaster, you have a lot of work to do. And I'm so proud of the fact that we have rebuilt our state, that our tourism industry is back, that people are back in their homes mm -hmm. and, and they're living lives under the new normal of post Sandy, New Jersey. So we had a lot of great things that we did as governor that I'm very proud of. But the thing I'm proudest of and the thing that I think will always define my governorship is how we prepared for and then recovered from Sandy. And you did a good job. Thank you. Okay, so we're from John from um, Farmingville, New York. This is a little bit convoluted, this question. So number, do you believe there is any feasible alternative to the polarized political system we have today? If so, do you believe it is possible to strip the party identity from the mindset of the constituents in favor of what their stance on individual issues are? No. Okay. I, I, a okay. simple answer to yeah, a very it took long me question. A while to get that but, down but, bad. But he deserves more than just <laughs> yes, the no. Does, yeah. I think. Listen. I get his question. The now. parties are ingrained in our political system now, and I don't believe there's a way for people to take away party identification. Now, it doesn't always mean that you have to agree with your own party, and it doesn't even mean that you always have to vote for somebody in your mm -hmm. party if you think there's a better man or woman in the other party. But the idea of, of stripping away those identities um, in people's minds, I think the two-party system started under uh, uh, Adams, uh, John Adams, the second president of the United States. Um, he was very upset about it. He didn't want there to be political parties. Um, and he was uh, with President Washington. And Thomas Jefferson had a different set of beliefs and went off and started his own party, which at the time was called the Democratic Republican Party. Oh. And the Adams Washington Party was called the Federalists. And so that two party system started all the way back then. And the names have changed over time. But in the, e in the end, there's always been a right of center party and a left of center party. Jefferson represented the left of center party back then. The Democratic Republican Party eventually dropped the Republican part off of them and just called themselves Democrats. And then the Republicans came into being 
Um, they first were the Federalists, then they were the Whigs, and then ultimately they came into being um, under Abraham Lincoln, and he is the father of the modern American Republican okay. Party. With all that history, I have a hard time believing we'll be able to strip it away, which is another reason why, since even though he didn't ask, why Howard Schultz should just go get more Starbucks and not waste his money <laughs> on, on running as an independent for president because we've never elected an independent for president and I don't think we're about to anytime soon. <laughs> well, here's, here's an easy one from Egg Harbor Township. Oh, Best regards Jersey. from, who's this, Harry Hurley. Harry Hurley, saying, I just did his radio Amodio, show. He said, in, he said, hello to his good friend, okay? And now this is from Suzanne. This is just a lovely comment. No question, but I just want to say I admire you and love your position on Trump. And she is from North, North Smithfield, Rhode Island. Excellent. Okay. So anonymous, but it says, the question, in what way did writing this book change your life? I don't think it changed my life. But I think what it did was give me an opportunity when our lives are as busy as they are mm -hmm. today and as occupied by so many different things whether it's reading, whether it's social media, all these new stimulants that are coming our way, streaming video, all this different stuff where you literally don't have to be by yourself for a second if you don't want to, no matter where you are anywhere in America. It gave me some time to reflect. It gave me time to reflect on my life. And, and I think that's a really precious gift that I had an excuse to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I had a, a deadline to meet, I had a book to produce, and I couldn't do it right if I wasn't reflecting on my life and trying to be honest with the people who were going to read the book um, and give them a real window into what my life has been like and what it was like to, to have all the experiences that we've had so far. So it didn't change my life, but it gave me a really precious opportunity yeah. to reflect on it. That's a wonderful answer. Um, okay, and just one other question. What motivates you? Well, actually, we have a couple more. All right. What, what motivates you? What motivates me? Um, winning is one of the things <laughs> that motivates me. Well, yes, that you know, you like to win, and, yes. and, 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 and I've always been somebody in my life who's loved to compete. Um, and if you compete, most people who compete love to win. Um, causes motivate me. Um, if I feel like I see something that's being done wrong, I want to try to make it right. And so um, until I get it right, I'm always pushing and trying to find new ways to get myself into the middle of that fight to affect it. Um, being a father motivates me mm. because- um, It's hard. <laughs> it, it is, and, and you know, you. someone asked me this week during the book tour about, um, do I think, do I tell my children that President Trump is a role model? And I said, no, I don't. I said, and quite frankly, the role model, the only role models children should need are their parents. Uh, if, you're, if, if your parents do the right job, they set you off on the right mm -hmm. course, and then you can pick whoever you want to emulate outside of your family as you mature. But if you don't do a good job as role models, you know, your children have a much bigger struggle. Mm -hmm. So what, what I hope is that through the things that I've done, um, and this is what motivates me about it. I want my children to see a good example set by me and by my wife and to try to emulate in their own lives, in their own ways, the things that we do every day. And that motivates me as well. Now you have four children, right? Yes, I do. I have four children. I have a son, Andrew, who is 25, who graduated from Princeton in 2016. I have a daughter, Sarah, who is 22, who just graduated last year from Notre Dame. Um, I have a son, Patrick, who's 18 and is a senior in high school. He's getting ready to go off to college in the fall. We don't know where yet. We're going through the lovely college the agonies, admissions the season. The agonies of the dam. Yes, yes. so they're, you know, where, where there's stress in the there. house every oh, minute between oh. grades and SATs and letters of recommendation and early action versus early decision oh. versus deferments. It's a great time. Um, yeah, so we're going through that with Patrick right now. And then we have Bridget, who is 15, and she is a sophomore in high school and a basketball and lacrosse player and um, is, uh, is just a absolute ball of fire like her mother. I mean, she's your baby, too. She <laughs> That's is. That's a good part. Okay. She is. All right. How do we get people to be excited about being American again? 
You know the best way to get excited about being an American? Go to another country. <laughs> Go to another country and hang there for a while. Because you'll find two things. One, more likely than not, after a week or two, you're going to miss America. You're going to miss all of the freedoms you have here. You're going to miss all of the conveniences you have here. You're going to miss all the opportunity you have here. You're going to miss all that makes this country the shining beacon that it mm -hmm. is for the rest of the world. Um, the other thing you're going to find if you stay in another country for a few weeks, when people find out you're an American, they come up to you and they ask you about it and they want to come here because they feel like this is the place where there's the most opportunity in the world to be successful, to be happy, to be free. So I think the best way to be inspired as an American is, you know, take yourself to another country for a week um, and see how much you miss this place. Because for those of us who are lucky enough to be born here, and this is not to say our country is perfect, it's not. Um, you know, the Constitution says that it, our Constitution is an effort to make a more perfect union, which implies in there that we don't have one. And I don't think we ever will have a perfect union. But um, the fact is that when you're lucky enough to be born into this place, there's just a, a way you take it for granted after a while. You can't help but do that. So every once in a while, I like to go to some places where uh, life is a lot tougher mm. and the struggle for freedom and for success is a lot more than it is here. And then it reminds you again how lucky you were to be born here and have the, have the privilege of living here and being able to do whatever you want to do. So if you want to tune into Premier Live, um, <laughs> you know, at 10 o'clock on a, a Friday morning, Hell in America, go ahead and you can do it. You just can don't even let, go, just, go, go to Premier Collectible. Do PremierCollectibles.com right. uh, yes, slash Chris Christie and That's get right. a signed copy. All right, we're now going to put you through 22 questions in two minutes. Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Who's timing? Ready to go? Okay. Where were you born? Newark, New Jersey. Who would you want to play in a movie? George Clooney. What was your first job? Gas station attendant. What is your biggest fear? Losing my family. Who makes you laugh the most? My son, Patrick. What is the one thing you need to have in your fridge at all times? Milk. What is your greatest accomplishment? Um, becoming governor of New Jersey. Who is the most in interesting person you've met recently? The most interesting person I've met recently. I've met so many interesting people. Uh, Bradley Cooper. What is your middle name? James. What is your biggest pet peeve? People who whine. What is the last book you read? Not your own. Um, the last book I read was uh, The Black Edge. What is your favorite hobby? Um, coaching my kids in sports. What is your guilty pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> Eating too much. Do you have any hidden talents? Yes, I'm a fabulous singer. <laughs> what, what color is your toothbrush? Blue. What is your secret snack? My secret snack, crackling oat bran. <laughs> How do you take your coffee? I don't drink coffee. Oh, okay. What is the last movie you saw in a movie theater? I saw The Upside this past Saturday night. What is Very the, funny. I heard wonderful. What is the last gift you gave? The last gift I gave was a whole bunch of gifts that I gave at Christmas. Okay, that's fair. All right, what, what cause is very dear to your heart? Uh, drug and alcohol addiction. Okay, what is the number one in your actual bucket list? What is number one? Being president of the United States. <laughs> okay. And where do you want to go that you have never been? Australia. A must. And we thank you very much. And you've been absolutely terrific today. What a joy to have you here. Well, it's and great. And congratulations on the book. We are thrilled. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled with it, too. And thanks for everybody who tuned in.